Bem, olá a todos, já estamos aqui para gravar mais um podcast do Tricast. Estou aqui com o convidado desta semana, que é o Michael Erickson. Antes de avançarmos para a conversa com o treinador e host do podcast da Triathlon Show, gostava de agradecer uh, aos novos membros do Tricast, neste caso João Pinto, Rui Vieira e Ricardo Camacho. Gostava também de agradecer às pessoas que deram, através dos cafés, dos coffees, a sua donation e contribuíram aqui para ajudar o podcast. Se quiserem aderir ao membership do Tricast e ter conteúdo exclusivo, basta clicarem no link, primeiro link da descrição, ou se quiserem apenas contribuir com uma tip, com uma ajuda, podem dar um café ou dois um, e apoiar também o projeto. Portanto, vou passar agora a conversa com o Michael. O Michael é finlandês, vive em Portugal e a conversa vai ser em inglês para ter uma maior fluidez. Um, e portanto se precisarem ativem as legendas, eu acho que é capaz de ao fim de um dia ou dois já existir a possibilidade de legendar em português se não uh, as legendas em inglês So uh, Michael, let's start this uh, First of all, thanks to, to accept my invite and be here in Tricast. I, I've been following uh, that triathlon uh, show for, for a long time and uh, I will start the conversation from that because Uh, you have the opportunity to talk almost with every good coach and um, professional athlete. So my question is about, could you tell the people a little bit about the process from creating your podcast until today? And um, what was the biggest learnings from, from the podcast? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you, Hugo, for inviting me. I'm, I'm really honored and happy to, to be here. And I I'm also a regular listener of uh, Tricast, so so it's very nice to uh, to get an invite. Um, about that triathlon show, uh, it started in uh, 2017, early 2017. So now we're actually very close, I think, to the to the seventh anniversary, uh, which will be at the end of this month. I don't know the exact date. Um, the reason for for this was basically. I I thought that it would be, there were se several reasons, but one of the main ones was that uh, I really wanted to learn from uh, people that had a lot of experience in coaching, especially, but also scientists, more academically minded people and uh, and get basically get access to knowledge that, that I was hard to access otherwise. It's not so easy to, I don't know, get to be an assistant coach of a very world-class coach in um, in one of the main um, squads let's say in world triathlon or in um, long distance triathlon so so the podcast was a was an attempt to basically get access to to more knowledge and more people with that knowledge and experience uh, it was also because i was uh, coaching myself getting into coaching but uh, of course it helps to to get some basically get some visibility and uh I was doing before that I was actually doing some blogging, but I found that that was very hard because I was very perfectionistic and I almost wanted to write a book every time I tried to write a post. So it just was too hard for me to do that. It took so long because I wanted it to be perfect. And I thought that a different way would be to have more natural conversations, intri prepared interviews, but but still then put out the interview mm -hmm. in its entire entirety and uh, an easier way of content creation basically so so those were the the two main main reasons i would say to so start when, the podcast when you when you start doing the the podcast uh you are starting co coaching at that time so uh no i i had started a bit i had started earlier um at first i started a bit in in running uh a couple of years before that and then then in triathlon a bit later Uh, so, so I had started, but not so much earlier, maybe one, one year before or so. Mm -hmm. And talk a little bit about the process of getting the guests because you start the podcast and then you have names like Dan Loring, uh, maybe a lot of very good, uh, coaches, almost Dan Plus. I remember the podcast with Dan Plus, Joe Filial. So you have almost the top three, um, coaches and one of the best there and you interview a lot of professional athletes from from top uh, long distance till um short course athletes so how was the process of getting that kind of top tier guests um from your side i think in the in the early years in 
2017, 2018, 2019 even, there weren't as many podcasts as there are now. So these, a lot of, first of all, then there wasn't as much focus on coaches in media. So I think very few people actually knew who uh, Dan Lodang was or who um, Joel Filial was. Okay. Of course, yeah. a few people knew, but much fewer. So they weren't used to, they didn't get requests to be on podcast all the time. You, I, I think actually for a lot of them, for Joel Filial, for example, he had his own podcast that he did, but it was probably the first time he was invited on somebody else's podcast or one of the first times anyway. So it was in that way easier because maybe now somebody like that will get requests for interviews all the time and then they have to choose a bit, but it was a bit easier. But also I was quite systematic in how I approached it and um, I, I followed up several times because sometimes these kinds of uh, coaches are very busy so it might not be enough to send one email maybe you have to send three or four emails and then on the fourth time they notice it <laughs> so we're mm -hmm. trying to not be not be pushy of course but but be polite but but also be um following up i think is is important in especially when you're starting out now it's a bit easier because most of these coaches they already know the podcast and they know the other people that have been on but back then, I think that following up was was an important part of uh, of the reason that so many coaches ended up coming, and then of course that they didn't have as many interview requests anyway back back in the day. Yes, because your podcast, it, you have so many episodes, you cover so many topics that you start to having like a, a super notable uh, podcast. And uh, if people search um, scientific triathlon, they have the show notes from the all the podcasts, and they can get free information of quality. And uh, you are start saying in the in the start that you you your main goal with the podcast was to get knowledge, and your website is fantastic to get knowledge about almost every topic. Uh, like uh, some weeks ago, I was thinking on caffeine consumption pre-race and you have a podcast. I listened to that and I apply that for my racing. So it's a very good way to think on some topics, strength training, nutrition, um, bike training or uh, endurance training. And you there have like three, four, five um, guests that are top quality and people can can listen and, and learn a lot from that. So... After talking a little bit about the podcast that I suggest a lot to my listeners of TreeCast that like technical podcasts to listen, um, I want to dive a little bit um, to um, training because you are a very good coach and you coach uh, athletes um, from professional to age group level. So as a coach, and this is a question that I normally like to do uh, for all the, the coaches that I have here on the show about your training philosophy, training fundamentals that uh, you use to plan your training. Yeah, um, I think it starts with uh, consistency. Consistency is, is the most important thing of everything. And uh, everything that that I do as a coach is, uh, first of all, uh, trying to build and maintain consistency. So one of the most important things is basically just avoiding mistakes. So mistakes that lead to losing consistency. So that injuries is of course the most most evident example, but there are also other examples. Maybe it can be mental fatigue about the training. So for example, if the training is too boring, then uh, that might lead to, you just feel like you need a couple of days off training. So, so even if the training is good, if it's boring, then that might lead to loss of consistency. Um, if it's maybe it doesn't lead to injuries, but it leads to, if it's too hard, you're running out of energy, you cannot sustain the, uh, uh, the nutritional intakes. Then that's another example. So, so everything is basically focused on, uh, first of all, building and maintaining consistency. And, and then only when that is in place and, and when that is good, that, that that's at only at that point, can we start to look at more, uh, more details, basically. The other main uh, part of uh, of my philosophy, I guess, is that I think context matters more than content. And what what I mean by that is that it's not there's not one type of training or one type of workout or one 
formula about how to construct training that is better than the other but what really matters is okay what is the context what what type of athlete do we have what goals do they have and then f f really understanding the fundamental context underpinning what you're what you're trying to do with the training and then the training can be really um different depending on on the context it's uh reminded me of something that i read the other day actually that it from medicine like some famous doctor back in the day said something that uh when when you have a patient in front of you uh try first to understand the patient try not to understand the the disease so basically mm -hmm. what they're saying is that the somebody like somebody who is maybe sedentary and uh, not in very good fitness yeah, try to understand the all the the big picture yeah exactly yeah so 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 that's that's another really important part then third i think that and i think that this is something that maybe gets misunderstood a little bit or people sometimes think that i'm i'm very uh, focused on physiology uh, which I am, I, I like that, but but I'm not more focused on it than uh, than other aspects of training and performance like psychology. And uh, so basically I'm a believer in the biopsychosocial model of training, which means that psychology, physiology, even the social uh, nature around training, the environment that you train in, they all interact. And, uh, and they, it's different for each athlete. So some athletes they enjoy a certain type of training and then that may might give them a better response from that type of training simply because they enjoy it or the same workout but done in a group can be feel so much better for an athlete if they enjoy that type of training so mm -hmm. and they get a better response from that so that's kind of the social aspect or in terms of environmental is not in the in the term biopsychosocial but i kind of see social as also a part of that is environmental so an example of that would be an athlete in finland right now it obviously has yeah. a very different environment to train in than an athlete in yeah. portugal so so you need to take that into account and you also need to may, maybe i wouldn't give four hour rides to an athlete in finland because they have to do it on the trainer and and you take those sorts of things into account so there's again there's no one formula but considering all of those those elements the physiology but also the psychology and the environment and uh, even the the social aspects of of training in an individual sport so yeah that's uh, th those are basically the three main underpinnings i would say of my coaching with and uh, and it's i think it's important to to point out then that i'm not talking at all about do we do high volume, low volume? Do we do high mm -hmm. intensity, low intensity? What is the training intensity distribution? Do we recover every third or every fourth week? Or do we do consistent weeks? Those things can all change. Uh, and that really depends again on the on the context, what will allow us to achieve consistency and, and uh, the needs of the athlete, both psychologically and physiologically. And uh, But yeah, those are some more higher level rules I, that I basically live by as a as a coach yeah that's great topics that you choose and like like you you say the the weather affects so much because today was a perfect day for training so i was riding with shorts uh in the winter so mm -hmm. and the um, this training goes pretty much easier than a training where you do in the in the garage in a in a trainer and it's so painful sometimes and that affects all the um, all the the mental part from the athlete, and then the recovery and other stuff that uh, goes around that. Uh, another question that that I was thinking when you were talking was about your routine as a coach, because you you still train, uh, you you compete as an athlete, but how how you plan normally your days as a coach, uh, including the other stuff that you did, but. In terms of uh, planning, training, uh, structure, um, training camps, uh, being uh, coaching uh, presential, I don't know, but learning um, how you organize normally your week or your you plan as a coach to do everything and uh, always try to, to learn a little bit about uh, uh, 
uh, new topics because uh, every month, every week, we have something new, some new research about uh, some something. And uh, I believe you you always try to to be on top of all the news about new new things and new methodologies of training. Yeah, uh, and that's a good question. I, I think it's, and it's definitely something that has changed for me over the years uh, for several reasons. But I think the the first point there is that as a coach, it's it's not like a job where you go, let's say you work at a bank, you start at nine, you finish at five, mm -hmm. and then before and after you can think about other things. You can think about your family, your training, your your other hobbies. And, uh, but, but when, when you're a coach, you can get a, like, you can get a text message anytime and, and you, that you maybe don't need to answer immediately, but, but you can basically, you're half on call all the time. So, and you're also, uh, usually you tend to end up thinking about things, uh, a lot all the time. So you don't necessarily have an, as much of an on and off structure, uh, you're, even when you're off work, you can be almost half on. So mm -hmm. one thing that I found that works, uh, that, I, that I have improved a lot is to actually try to take the weekends and do a minimal amount of coaching normally. Uh, sometimes I will go and check well, my athletes training peaks even on the weekend, but, but it's not always. So, and, and I tell my athletes what my schedule is so that they know, they know what to expect. Um, but this has helped me to really avoid burnout because it's something that I experienced in 2019. I was, well, not really full burnout, but I was definitely working so much and, and, and not just working so much, but it was the fact that it was every day. I was a lot of time, but it was every day. There was no, no off. And I find that actually focusing my work week so that I work a bit more like a person working at a bank Monday to Friday, that has helped a lot. Um, but the time schedule is still a bit different because I prefer it that way. So I start quite early, usually uh, get up at five, start working around six. Uh, I spend the first hour of the day usually having breakfast and then do some Portuguese practice. So that's my first hour. But then six o'clock, I, uh, I start coaching and then I coach for a few hours, basically go through all of my athletes, uh, workouts and comments that they have in training peaks and, uh, send messages, schedule calls, have some calls with them. And then maybe I take a break in the morning T today, for example, at eight 30, I went, went out for a run and came back, started working again at 10, then took another break at one to go swimming. And now I will work until probably, uh, seven, seven in the evening, seven 15. And, and I have that routine every, yeah, every evening, basically I finish at seven 15 and I start at six o'clock. So having that routine in the middle, I will have a couple of, um, of my own training that I do. So, so that helps me break up the day, but, mm -hmm. and I, I can easier stay focused during the day, but, uh, but having that routine and then also knowing that Saturday and Sunday will be more focused on myself and my wife and, and, uh, not so much on the work that really helps me have more balance in life. And I think, yeah, it's something that a lot of coaches struggle with burnout and stress and being constantly on. And when you do that, you also start doing worse quality work. Uh, yeah. I've found that. So, so I think having a routine and find and a routine with you do, you, you can't have, it, it will never be the same as a normal job because you won't have the ability to, let's say, take four weeks off in the summer where you do nothing related to work because your yeah. athletes still are training, they are racing. That's not possible. But but I think you have to find a middle ground where you still get some sort of break. And and I think for me, what works nice is to have the, the weekend where I usually do very little work. So yeah, and in terms of uh, staying on top of new research and things, a lot of that comes from um, from preparing for podcast interviews. So maybe, for example, I can have the same ideas you had and decide that I, I want to learn what is the, what is the, the latest evidence about caffeine uh, for racing or for training. And then I decide that, okay, I'm going to read about this, but then I'm going to in invite an expert guest as well and talk with them. And usually what happens is that in this case, I would invite some researcher and I would read the studies that they have done and, and that would help me stay up to date on yeah. that topic. 
So it's not, you, you can't keep up with everything that is published. It's, it's impossible, but you have to be a bit selective. What are the topics that you really need to, or want to learn about? And, uh, and then for me, it works quite nicely because at the same time as I'm learning about a topic, I can prepare an interview that I then, uh, produce for that triathlon show. Uh, so yeah, that's a bit how, yeah, how, how I, how I plan my, my learning, my, uh, further education. Yeah. It's very interesting because you can do like a mix of things. You can learn, you can produce content to people. And then you can uh, you can have like a, a show, a podcast, and grow your audience and your base for 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 coaching, and you're still learning and producing content, and it's like an easy way to to get because maybe if you yeah. don't have the podcast, you will not have the the initiative to to go find uh, some some new research and and uh, read so many so many things. So that's a, a very interesting one. Um, and about uh, what you say about the burnout, I think maybe sometimes coaches uh, get too much motivated and then uh, sometimes they they have too many feedbacks from the athletes and uh, then you, you start losing a little bit the control of everything because you, you, you still need to manage your, your life, your training, your your family, your personal personal life and then when you start to grow your your coaching you start to have a lot of athletes and if you ask a lot of feedback then it's a boom it's a lot of information at the same time and sometimes the information comes in timings that you are not uh, so prepared to to answer and then i think you start to stress a lot because um it's a lot of things happen and as you said uh, it's not a 8 to 8 work it's uh, people answer and uh, train at different timings. And it's very hard for a coach that have a professional life uh, coaching to manage that. And it's a good perspective from you that uh, having a little bit of uh, a middle ground between everything can help a lot to find um, the fine line to, to be a good yeah. coach and still still have a good work. I want to now go uh, again in training because I believe that you are one of the best guesses that I have here to talk about these topics. Um, during a phase where, where most triathletes are now in pre-season, uh, the biggest races start in mid-April, some races starting now, but it's more a uh, start of the season. Um, what, in your opinion, are the most important aspects to, to consider the, during this phase of the season where everyone is preparing for competing um, in a, a very short period of time now? So I think the most, or one of the most important things anyway, is to, it's a bit too late now, but for next, for next year, it will be possible to take this into account, but to actually start the preseason fresh and recovered and healthy. So taking some rest, proper rest at the end of your season, which maybe it's, maybe it's in October, maybe it's after Ironman Portugal or something, uh, uh, normally, I would recommend for for a lot of people. I recommend taking for age groupers. I would recommend taking two weeks completely off uh, triathlon. It doesn't mean that you have to just lay in bed or sit on the couch, but you can do other things. Either play some football or volleyball, or um, do play with your kids. Those sorts of things. Be active. Uh -huh. That's okay. Go and do hikes. But I just think taking time completely off from from swim, bike, run for a couple of weeks is uh, is healthy and uh, it will allow you to recover physically and mentally and and if you feel like you need more that's also totally okay i think three weeks even four weeks of swim swim biking and running can be can be completely fine and i think for a lot of professional athletes especially a slightly longer uh off uh, like time completely off is sometimes needed if they have had a very long season because uh, professional athletes train so much every week that it's really accumulating a lot of fatigue over the year and and it can take a little bit longer to get rid of that fatigue but i think that very often you will feel basically when you start to feel really really that i have to get back to swimming biking and running now i'm getting crazy then take a few more days that you that you rest and and then you get back to it that that's a good uh, good rule of thumb i would say um, 
And but then when you get started with preseason, uh, it yeah, because then basically you want to be able to do what we talked about before, be really consistent. So so I think it's it's an easy mistake to make that you you don't really take a time off, but then you have some weeks that you're not really training a lot and some weeks that you're training a bit more, but you you don't have that consistency. So so what I what I would encourage people to do is to take that time completely off so that you are then super motivated and uh, recovered and healthy enough that you get back to training and you can be really consistent until your races start, basically. Of course, there, there will be some, maybe during Christmas, you have some 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 time off because of family commitments and so on that's that's okay but but in the in the grand scheme of things you want to then be able to be as as consistent as as possible uh, but then the other the other aspects of preseason once you're in the preseason training again um i i think that it's really important to not train too hard and not build up intensity too quickly because it's very normal for people to uh, hit their best numbers, power numbers, or pace numbers of the year in February and then, or March, and then it just gets harder and harder to to reach those same numbers, or you might not even reach them again. Uh, I've definitely fallen for this trap myself before. So, uh, so basically, avoid doing too much intensity because uh, you will basically just peak so early and then and then it's really hard to to peak again you can you can do it but then it requires maybe taking some more recovery and, and building up again so, I, so just better... uh, about that topic um i believe one of the the biggest things of uh cannot peak again or, or beating your personal bests in the in the preseason is because you have such a long period where you can just focus on training and not racing and then what i as an athlete, what I feel is that when you start to having like uh, a race and then you have uh, two weeks of training, then you compete again, then you have three weeks and then you compete again, you are always trying to recover from the racing, trying to taper for the other, and you have like a five-day period to train. Um, and that's a very uh, th difficult thing, in my opinion, to manage well. Um, what do you think about keeping um form towards all the season because yeah. i see that maybe you need to sacrifice a little bit the training uh, the the taper for some races and prioritize just two or three and then try to just do a little taper and then after the race try to recover as fast as possible to uh, build on training as fast as possible to to don't lose too much fitness because I see that a lot of people lose so much fitness just because they start competing. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I think I, I think that one one thing that you have to do at some point, if you're racing very frequently, uh, you're racing uh, once every every two weeks or once every three weeks, then at some point you have to just rebuild your aerobic base. So basically put in a big block of volume I think because that's what you often lose when you get to that racing period because of tapering, because of recovering, you lose volume. You still try to get in your race specific intensity workouts, uh, so that you you feel so you are, like so, fast. But you, yeah, but you lose but you, the but yeah. you don't have enough total. The thing is that intensity is still if you do a ten kilometer run where you do six kilometers of intensity that's still a much lower load than a 20 kilometer run with no intensity so in terms of your overall load your and the same of course principle applies in in swimming and and cycling so your overall load uh chronic workload is so much lower because of the lack of, of volume so and that is what peaking is like when you're peaking tapering you want to reduce the workload and you want to reduce the volume for that reason but if you do it, but if you keep the volume lower than it was during the winter throughout the entire six months, maybe that you're racing, then you yes, your fitness, fitness will be lower. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, so basically, I think what the solution is is that you need to try to periodize your season in a way that maybe you do have your higher highest volume period in winter, and then you get into some some early races. Maybe you do two, three races, but then find some time to add in more volume again. again. Exactly. Even if it means maybe sacrificing a bit the performance in some races.
Mm -hmm. So basically doing the, the type of work that you do in preseason in the middle, but shorter period of times, of course, and yeah. maybe you do some little things that you are not doing on a preseason. But just to finish the preseason, because I, I have a middle question and then I, I break up a little bit your what you are saying. You were saying that maybe the best work to do in preseason is low intensity volume and working on maybe stuff that people don't cannot work so much when they start racing uh yeah so um yeah i think that you definitely yeah you have to have do a lot of low intensity training or you should but but also you definitely add in some higher intensity workouts but then what that is depends a bit on the the athlete and the goal so with the athletes that i coach some of them might be working more on let's say vo2 max uh and some others are working more on threshold uh, intervals but um, so so it's definitely not doing only low intensity it, it, there is intensity as well but it is very uh adapted to what the individual needs and but the key thing i think is to not do too much of that so i think that you should always feel not in a workout, but in throughout the week in preseason, that you have something in reserve. That okay, I could do, I could do another intense session if I yeah, wanted to. I, I could do a bit more volume. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just, just so. a little question to to finish uh, this part. Um, you talk about VO2 max. You talk about threshold LT2. So my question is: normally, when we raise VO2 max, we can now you you get to a good level of VO2 max. You work on that. Then if you, you start doing LT2 threshold type of work, maybe your threshold will raise a bit because you have a, a lead, a bigger gap between VO2 max intensity and LT2. Um, but how much time should you work on that? Because you raise VO2 max, you work on threshold, but then maybe you need to go, a go again to work on VO2 max because you will like end up stagnate in a in a level uh in 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 weeks working on that so what is your approach about this type of of uh, work because as an athlete we always try to have a higher threshold and we want to improve it but for you what's the best way to manage this vo2 max threshold type of training periods yeah i think uh you yeah it's hard and there, there are different ways to to do it, but but what I found usually works quite well is doing VO two max work for a pretty short period. So focusing on it for two or three weeks, and then may, then you usually take one week really easy because when you focus on VO two max, then that's very intense training. You have to do very intense training. So then take one week easy after you finish your two or three week block. And then maybe you can go and focus on threshold. And for that, you can focus on it for, for longer. Uh, and it's not, not as intense. It should be very controlled. And uh, it's more about how much total work are you doing rather than it feeling very hard. So, um, and then I think within a year, you can probably do a few, but let's say two to four times you focus on, on VO2 max for two to three weeks. But I've I probably never given more than four blocks of that throughout a year. So then if it's and then it's more probably at least the third and the fourth time it's only two weeks, not three weeks. So mm -hmm. so it's not I think I think it's and and this this is more the exception because for most people it's more that we would maybe do it two times in a year or maybe three times in a year because I think I still think that that for most people they are they have more room to improve their uh, threshold as a percentage of their VO2 max. Because if you look at at uh, the really world-class athletes, look at runners, look at uh, Paula Radcliffe was an interesting case study. She threshold basically is very reached... close to VO2, yeah. Exactly. You can get very close. Of course, some of that is maybe individual genetic potential that some people can get very close and some people cannot get quite as close. But I still think that most people are, um, yeah, have room to get yeah. closer with their threshold to their VO2 max by focusing more on the aerobic side of of training and training at or below threshold. Uh, lots of easy training and some threshold training, basically. Mm -hmm. I, I I think that a good ex example about what you are saying is Eliud Kipchoge that runs a marathon at ninety six percent of his VO2 max. So. 
Um, exactly. It's a lot of people run marathons under 80%. So they have like a very big gap to, to bridge up to the, their full potential. So the, uh, it's basically trying to be as efficient as possible at a higher pace. Another question that I think it's interesting, especially because the majority of the, the athletes that are listening to our podcast are age group athletes. And for age group athletes, fitting the training in the work and family routine is one of the biggest uh, things to, to and adjustments to do as a coach. And uh, I have here an example of two cases, uh, one age grouper that trains around 10 hours a week. Um, so it trains like eight, 12 hours, average, averaging 10 hours a week. And then an athlete that uh, trains around 20 hours a week, that I believe is one of uh, the upper limits for a for an age grouper that works uh, eight hours per day. Um, biggest difference and difference in approach because it's very different to train 10 or train 20 hours a week. But in the same cases, the age grouper want to to go as fast as possible because you just have 10 hours, but you want to be as competitive as possible. So how you fit a program for, for both cases that I that I suggest? The the biggest difference with age groupers that train at a high volume, let's say 20 hours, is um, fueling, getting enough energy. So it's not it's not so much, of course, the program is a bit different but but the biggest difference for me as a coach is to educate them about how important it is that they uh, fuel enough and uh, both in training but uh, around training for their day-to-day -day meals and uh, and yeah ev everything because uh, I think this is a, a common mistake with age groupers that train at a high volume is that they just don't eat enough or don't, don't get enough energy and then they don't get better so basically the training is just making them worse instead of better because they're under fueling so so that is the the big difference at 10 hours it's quite manageable not not super hard to to fuel the training but at 20 hours it's suddenly um, quite hard and especially the the fitter and faster you are when you're producing a lot of power on the bike when you're um, doing a lot of kilometers on the run or in the pool then you're burning more energy and uh, and it becomes harder harder and harder uh, to do that. Uh, so I, I was just on, on camp in, uh, Lanzarote with, uh, with, uh, a pro athlete that I coach and, and he doesn't train super high volume. Uh, we're actually just increasing his volume this year. So now he's training 25 hours a week, which is still not super high for a professional athlete. Um, but, uh, when, uh, and, and I was doing a lot of the training with him, but not all of it because I couldn't, couldn't do it. And I got dropped a few times, which is okay. <laughs> But uh, anyway, the, the amount of food that that we were eating, but especially that he was eating, it was very clear that he was a lot better than, than I was at eating and fueling the training. And I think that that's something that would be interesting for age groupers to see, like how much you actually need to eat to fuel that kind of training. It is um, it looks pretty insane, to be honest, for most for most people, but but it's it's what you have to do. So so that's that's the biggest difference, I would say. But uh, then in terms of training, when when you are training at uh, the le slightly lower volume 10 hours is still a lot of course it's a good volume but you can do a slightly higher percentage of your training at higher intensities if if you have lower uh, a lower volume if you're training five hours then even higher percentage can be a higher percentage so there, there's no um a, a lot of people have probably heard about 80 20 and and that is a good concept to understand the importance of low intensity training but it's also it's not at all a scientific finding or pres it's not a training prescription that you have to do 80 percent of your training at low intensity it, it really depends if you're training five six hours then you can you can do a lot more intensity mm -hmm. than 20 percent so um so yeah the percentage of intensity can be can be a bit higher when you're training 10 hours compared to 20 hours uh, but but this also depends on the overall life stresses because if you're training ten hours, uh, it maybe it is just because you have a very or it probably is because you have a stressful life, you have a family and you have a stressful job, and uh, so you probably still you don't spend the extra time sleeping and cooking and eating. You spend the extra time 
running errands, picking up your kids, doing your work and all of that. So, so it may be, uh, when I say that you can do slightly higher percentages of intensities, it doesn't mean do anything crazy. And, and in many cases, it means that it, it, you don't do any more intensity or any higher percentages of intensity because you just have so much else to recover from. But in some cases it is possible. It, it depends on the outside stressors a lot, I think. But then even within the low intensity training, there is a big difference because with athletes training 20 hours a week, I almost never give the athlete uh, zone two training. Uh, I do basically all the low intensity training as zone one. So it's not that I necessarily say that this is zone one training, but I just tell them go out and ride really easy, go out and run really easy, swim really easy. And more based on RPE, rating or perceived exertion, so your how you feel. Of course, if it's an athlete that I see that they run a bit too fast or they bike a bit too hard, then I will tell them and we will maybe give some more specific targets with heart rate or power and pace. But but with a lot of athletes training 20 hours a week, they are very experienced. So, so actually working on feel uh, is useful. But but getting back to the main point, when just the about it... I have just about a little question about zone two yeah. training, uh, because what this approach of zone one and then high intensity, uh, you still keep it for a professional athlete that work on full time, like uh, you you are zone two training is now a big thing. A lot of people are 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 saying that is a very important thing to do and. Uh, then a lot of people say zone two is uh, 75% FTP, then you have different definitions. So it's important to clarify zone two that I'm saying is under LT1. So a little bit, not uh, LT1, like if we say we have to 250 watts LT1, it's around 225, 230 watts. So close to that. Um, for age groups, you you say that maybe you will not approach zone two as a as a, a training uh, to to the week, but for a professional, what do you think? Um, yeah, I, I still, I, I for a professional, I I see zone two training as it can it becomes part of the training, but then I see it almost as not intensity training, but it's part okay. of the quality training. I see it as training that is hard to recover from. So I don't in preseason in this time of year, I don't I, I don't prescribe it specifically. So I tell the athletes to go out and ride RPE three to four out of ten, and yes, probably a lot of that time will actually be in zone two, so a bit two. closer to LT one. But it's more natural that maybe when they're climbing, it will be more closer to LT one, and when they're and then on the flats, it will be more far away from it. So for an exa for example, um, yeah, the athlete that I was with in Lanzarote, his LT1 is around 280 watts and uh, most of his riding is on average around 220 watts. So it's more like high zone one, I would say maybe low, mm -hmm. low Some zone Some parts two. zone two and then, yeah, yeah averaging yeah. But lower, it, but yeah. Yeah, but it's far from far from LT1. Probably LT1 is actually higher now because he's a lot fitter. So maybe LT1 is closer to 300 watts at, at this point anyway. So, um, so yeah, basically my point is that, um, that yeah, I, the easy training, not doing the easy training too hard, the easy training can be really easy. And then, and then make sure that when you have the, whatever your quality workout in the week is, uh, of course, all training is quality, but whatever your harder workout in the week is, if it's a threshold, threshold sessions or VO2 max sessions, or even zone two sessions that in this case are more higher intensity sessions so that you can really do them really well, feel really good, be recovered, be fresh and, and execute them as intended. So I think that that's a big difference. But when you're a 10 hour per week athlete, then the volume isn't so high. So then it makes more sense that, okay, mm -hmm. a lot of your yeah. endurance training can be in zone two, so it can be a bit higher. Yes, I agree. Uh, I think the more volume you do, maybe the less zone two you can uh, afford yeah. because zone two, okay, it's still demanding because if you are a little bit fatigued, uh, maybe you need more zone one training because especially for me on the bike, it's quite much easier to do zone two on the run. It's quite demanding for me to do zone two because I need to go uh, below four minutes per kilometer uh, around 340s, 345. So it's quite demanding, not just physiological, but uh, muscularity wise, it's very hard. 
on the bike i feel like a, a bit easier to to do the volume in days that you are a little bit more tired but still demanding because um and then I, it depends a little bit in how fit you are because if you are not so fit a 10 hour week athlete maybe for him to do zone 2 is quite easier than a very fit athlete where zone 2 can be especially where you are very good uh, still a very decent percentage of ftp or threshold pace yeah it, it definitely depends on how fit you are uh so this is also why women can sometimes do a bit more so into training because the power is a bit lower the pace is a bit lower so you don't burn as much energy doing going doing so into training so let's say for you maybe to do a decent zone two run you're running 16 kilometers an hour or something and and that is definitely more than 1000 calories an hour that you're uh that you're using same thing with yes. an athlete with an lt1 at 280 watts if they're riding at 260 watts for an hour that's around 1000 calories uh i think uh if if, if they're riding 260 280 it's 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 at or above 1000 calories an hour so you can easily get up to those numbers and then when you're already training 20 hours a week then just getting in enough calories is already hard enough so if your easy training which is the the endurance training is already is 1000 calories an hour it's really quickly getting impossible to to get in enough calories to to fuel that and recover from that so that is why but then if you're let's say even professional female athletes they might have an lt1 that is more like 200 210 200 220 uh watts 200 220 watts or so 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 then okay you can ride at 180 to 200 watts and it's not so hard it's more like 700 calories an hour it's a bit easier and more achievable to to do um let me see if there's anything uh yeah anything else i think the other the other thing the other difference with with a 10 hour per week athlete i think you just have to be much more deliberate with how efficient your training is because you just if you have goals to improve and to to perform well then you you just can't afford to waste as much time not that uh, not that anybody should waste time but but when you're doing a high volume then there is you can be a bit more relaxed about certain things for example if you're a 10 hour per week athlete and maybe on saturday you have you only have two hours to your long ride then stopping for a coffee in the middle of that ride probably not a good idea because you're basically making it two one hour rides it's it's not a good stimulus a good mm -hmm. kind of stress that you're going to necessarily get fitter from especially at least if you're already somewhat experienced uh, but if you're a 20 hour per week athlete and you have five hours to ride on saturday then by all means stop for a coffee you're still putting in a lot of work uh and uh and you're still going to yeah it's still going to be a good stimulus because just because of the the volume being so high so if you stop in the middle then that's not a problem those sorts of things swimming is another example where it's easy to waste i think a lot of time if you have uh, one hour on, of, on lunch break to swim then or you have let's say you have time based on your swimming speed maybe you you're able to get in 2000 to 2500 meters uh on on a lunch break swim then you don't want to waste more than 1000 meters doing a warm-up with a bunch of drills, drills yeah. kicking exactly yeah. you you need to do a short warm-up and then a big main set as big a main set as you can basically to be efficient that doesn't mean that the main set is super hard but it but it's focused on whatever it is that you're, you're trying yeah. to achieve it, it, drills and kicking it's still important but you need to just choose the things that you because it will compromise a lot the volume and you still need to do yeah the race distance so you need to train and be efficient in the water and maybe when you train less you can you will cut things that always are important but are not like fundamental to to exactly. you to complete distance and because you want to go as fast as possible and maybe that will compromise volume and volume is very a big part of training yeah yeah exactly so so yeah basically just focusing on on efficiency even in cycling i think that for when you have 10 hours a week usually you don't have a lot of time during the weekdays to do uh any 
you maybe have an hour to do a bike a ride after work then for most people living in a city uh, like lisbon for example it's probably better quality to do it indoors on the trainer i'm not that depends a bit like you can you yes. can find solutions it's quite hard you can to go... do an hour in lisbon yeah. because you have the the first part of the ride always you it's not good exactly so so it's not again this comes back to a little bit uh the biopsychosocial model there are definitely some athletes that should still do it outdoors because they just if you really don't like riding on the trainer then it probably doesn't make sense but but i think that there is in terms of efficiency this is uh, a tool that can be useful for a lot of athletes with less time to train to use during the the week when you you're busy you can but you can then quickly get in an efficient workout mm -hmm. Uh, even with just an hour, even with 45 minutes, you can you can get something something pretty good done uh, on the trainer. Another thing that I believe that can be interesting is for the 10 hour or uh, uh, people that don't have too much time to train. So especially bike is quite hard to to fit in the middle of the week or yeah, you can fit one hour, one hour in 10, but maybe you cannot fit like a two hour ride. So uh, approach that... I see that maybe can be interesting for, for that kind of uh, situation is doing the weekend, the biggest bike workouts and volume. And in the, uh, in the days between Monday and Friday, do swimming and running, because if you have one hour, one hour run can be a, a long run for some people. And a one hour bike is a very short and the stimulus is very low. So I believe maybe um monday friday more a swim run kind of workouts maybe you fit a, a, a bike workout but and then in the weekend you can put like real bike work because one hour bike it's very short you can do it on the trainer but it's still very low yeah definitely i think that that's a that's a good strategy that you can use to yeah you bike on both saturday and sunday and uh yeah in, in terms of running you can even even very good very fast professional athletes there are some you don't have i think that sometimes this is something that some people have the misconception that your long run you have to build it up to two hours and otherwise it's not a long run that's absolutely not not the case of course if you're training for a marathon or something then at some point you have to do those longer runs but but for general running fitness uh and especially if you're training for uh, let's say up to uh, up to 70.3 distance uh half distance triathlon then as, and this time of year you're not you're still far from the the races your long run one hour 15 minutes is a very good long run for most people uh even if it yeah e even if you're fit if you are fast. especially if you are very fast one hour 15 it's it's yep. a lot of kilometers it's yep upper to almost 20 if you are fast yeah and doing some exactly. intervals there yeah so so you can yeah it's much easier to get in a long long run whatever long run is for you during the week and uh, and then you can ad adjust it a bit to what time you have if you don't have so much time your long run doesn't have to be longer than an hour 15 uh, mm -hmm. or an hour for some people depending mm -hmm. on how how new you are uh, of course shorter for some people if you're very new but uh it, yeah that all depends so i think that that's a good plan yeah i believe this this question is uh it was very interesting for people because I think we have a lot of people that train very low and then they can apply some of these strategies and the people that train more maybe uh, have some some topics covered like low intensity, high intensity and maybe avoid some zone to uh, longer stuff training. Um, another question about training. And this is a more a race specific. We talk a little bit about general training. And now I want to dive a little bit more about race specific. Uh, people normally compete, especially age groupers, for 70.3s and full distance race. So I want to, to you to talk a little bit about training specific for uh, 70.3 and full distance. So the like the final six seven weeks specific preparation after you do all the base after you you cover the fundamentals then you start to race specific work and uh, about 70.3 and then about full distance what kind of difference between both distance and what kind of approach 
you will prioritize uh, for an athlete to be as fast as possible on race day. Mm. Yeah. So in in both cases, at the the final six six seven weeks, uh, should you should focus basically on on this race specificity. Maybe there are still some personal let's say weaknesses that you're also working on as a, a secondary goal but but mostly in this time period uh you you basically want to focus on uh, a lot of your training on the specific intensities in swimming biking and running that you will that you will do on on race day it doesn't necessarily mean all of your training or it definitely doesn't mean all of your training is at that intensity because still a lot of your training is just basic uh easy endurance training but but your key sessions uh, are focused more on the race specific intensity so that means a bit harder for 713 and and a bit easier for ironman this is the time period where if you're focusing on ironman then you will do a lot of zone 2 training because ironman is basically a uh -huh. zone 2 zone 2 intensity uh lt1 for for the really fit ones and uh, and maybe lower than lt1 for uh, for somebody that takes takes longer to do the race so um yeah i think i think that in terms of it's yeah it's it's there's not so much that i can say about it I, other than specificity this means you also want to make sure that you have your nutrition hydration strategy figured out so do do workouts with your and uh, trying out your nutrition hydration strategy and uh, that means doing a bike workout with race intensity with your race hydration race nutrition and then also i'm not a huge fan of doing a lot of uh, brick runs but but i think it makes sense to do it a couple of times in the in the last month or so before the race to and, and to check that you have the right pacing and the right nutrition hydration because if you start to do the brick run at your target pace and and you find that it's very hard and that it's not realistic to do that for 21 kilometers or 42 kilometers depending on which race you're training for then you have to figure out okay why is it too hard is it because my targets are not realistic or did i did i go too hard on the bike or did i maybe spike my power too much when going over hills so that i need to keep my power more in control and avoid those spikes or is it because my nutrition hydration strategy is not correct that i'm not fueling enough or hydrating enough so then you, you yep. can use those brick runs to problem solve and and see validate all of these factors do you have the pacing plan correct do you have the um the nutrition hydration correct and this is also the way that i come up with basically what is the pacing strategy for for an athlete i i never use it's the percentage of ftp or percentage of threshold or lt2 or whatever i never use that because there is a huge variation depending on the athlete's speed and their fitness uh so and um, their profile so so it, it it really comes down to okay i'm making a bit of a, a, a an educated guess that i think for you based on your training data you can probably hold this power for the bike let's try it in a session it. and then you run after it at your at this pace and uh, let's see how it goes and then if it doesn't go well then we try maybe a bit lower power next time or we try a bit higher mm -hmm. usually it's better to to you don't you generally want to more set yourself up for success than set up for set yourself up for failure so it's better to maybe take a more conservative target the first time you do yeah. one of these simulation sessions and and uh, find that oh it was actually slightly too easy so next time mm -hmm. you can try a bit harder uh, because it's never then a good opposite. feeling you... yes yeah exactly yeah uh in my case uh and from Kashkai where where i did the 70.3 and uh, because you are talking about brick sessions i i i, I used that approach um of uh, split the training like bike training in one day and the specific bike race specific training in one day and then uh, at sunday i have the or saturday long run specific and then uh, sunday i i always did my longest rides with a specific pace but then uh, two weeks prior to the race i did a brick so i i ride and then i run the race specific and it's not quite the same thing because if you are doing 325s uh, fresh in the morning and then you need to do 325 pace after doing one hour 70.3 uh, pace so it's very important for you to and i believe people need to do at least one bike and run 
pacing to say, like you said, to confirm if they can hold the pace because some people are very good doing uh, runs at race specific after being tired from the bike. And some people have a, a big gap between uh, what pace that can hold and uh, without biking hard. And then after biking hard, they, they drops quite significant the pace. And uh, uh, I think, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And and I think for uh, these longer distances, especially are, are very different how you approach it as an age grouper compared to how the professionals race it. The way the professionals race it, they really, really have to race it. And at the very, very top uh, of the age group ranks, it's, it's also a bit the same. But for most people, uh, it's more about really controlling the intensity because you can lose doing 10 watts more on the bike can lose you, yeah, you don't five, have the minutes, race five minutes on the yeah. on the run mm -hmm. so so it actually makes i think one common mistake is that people try a bit too much to to do their fastest possible bike split which they can do but then it it just costs too much in terms of the ability to run so so i think it's yeah it, it's something to focus on to not do not not do the bike too hard and basically you should be able to in training do close to yeah do do intervals that are mm -hmm. close to the race duration like do 20 minute intervals if you're going to to ride the the bike in two hours 30 let's say then uh, you should probably be able to do six times 20 minutes at race pace with five minute rests and it shouldn't feel too hard because uh even in training just because the intensity is low enough that that you can still run really well off of it and and i think the longer the race is the more important this becomes so especially for the full distance this is where you have athletes that can normally do a sub three hour marathon but uh but then in the ironman they can only maybe barely get under four hours just because mm -hmm. it's such a long day you're spending so much energy so and you're going a bit too hard on the bike so and and you just don't have the fitness for it so so i think being conservative on the bike is generally a good strategy and then if if you're conservative on the bike in this race at least you will have the feeling that okay the, the run was really good i was really strong on the bike maybe next time i try to push the bike a little bit harder and see how it goes mm -hmm. but but i think a lot of people fall into the trap of always pushing the bike and never really quite seeing what they're able to yeah. do on the run because uh, they're always a bit too tired of the bike yeah, a good uh, way of seeing if that is happening is compare your times without biking. Like if you are doing Olympic distance, if your time for 10K of, uh, without biking, just a 10K road race is 35 minutes. And then on the triathlon, you run 50 minutes, you know that you are over, over biking for sure. Yeah. But if your yeah. time is 37 minutes on the, the Olympic distance, that's maybe because you are doing a uh, pacing well and the two minutes is just yeah. because you have fatigued legs but uh, i have another question because you are and it's interesting for me because you you cover a point that is pacing a race when you are an age grouper and then pacing a race when you are a pro because when you are a pro you have race dynamics if you want to win you need to go you cannot just uh, i will ride 300 watts because it's my power but the group is getting away and you are losing minutes and minutes. So if you want to be competitive, fight for wins, fight for qualification for world world championship level races, you need to risk a bit. You need to go in the dynamics and then uh, see what happens. And in my case, um, and because I believe that will impact the way you prepare for a race, because... As yep. an age grouper competing in a 70.3, I was always doing a lot of race pace. And if my race pace is 280 watts, I will do four times 20 minutes at 280 watts. And I will do consistent that kind of work. What I believe is that now when I will approach the 70.3 um, the as a professional, I need quite more high intensity work and maybe I will do less of like my LT1 work than previously. So, or I will do like two minutes of uh, VO2 max and then five minutes LT1, that kind of work. So uh, as a coach that have age groups and pro professionals about this topic, what do you think? 
Yeah, I 100% agree with that. That that's how I um, structure the race specific training for for professionals. It's more stochastic, so it can be yeah examples like you gave. You it's not there are so many different ways you can do that, but just just one example might be maybe as an age grouper you're doing your 20 minute intervals steady as we said, but then as a professional you're doing one a one minute surge, and it might be. Not even a specific power target, but just the if you have done pre-professional races before, you know what it feels like when somebody's trying to push and you need to go. So just that feeling of okay, one minute of surging and then four minutes of settling in, one minute of surging, four minutes of settling in. So it's all uh, it it can be. It's not always even power or physiological based, but more based mm -hmm. on feeling of the race dynamics. So so that's an example. Um, and uh, but I think this is one one point here is that even for age groupers, depending on the race you're preparing for, you also have to take into account the the race course. So if you're doing a race that has a lot of really steep but short hills, let's say hills that take one minute, but you really have to push to threshold or above threshold, then this is something that you should prepare for. And then for this race course, you shouldn't be doing your steady 20 minute intervals at a constant constant power uh but but mm -hmm. you should break things up more according to what it will look like on the race course so i think that that's an important factor as well to take into account for any race distance whether it's sprint or ironman or anything in between uh factoring in the race course uh, especially on the on the bike is is really important yeah because on the run maybe is is where you will yeah just keep your pace and no, you will not gain as much as on the bike to to spike yeah. a lot. Instead, the run, maybe you're all, the run, if you go the to run. a sprint finish or something, maybe you will need some variation of pacing. But it's very like just keeping LT one or a little bit above yeah. if you can. Yeah. Okay, so I just have a, a last question about uh, this, and it's not just about training. Is it's a little bit about training, but uh, it's about technology and how to to use it properly. Uh, we now know that we have a lot of gadgets to available for swim, to bike, to run, to intensity control, to control training load and recovery. If we see whoop or or a ring or uh, gadgets like that. Um, just a little comment about technology, uh, how it can help people what is the most uh, important gadgets to have. Um, talk a little bit about the technology part of triathlon because it's getting here. The technology is yep. getting starting to get a lot of impact. Yeah. I think, I think the best strategy when it comes to how to use technology is to use some technology and learn to use it really, really well but not using a lot of technology and using it poorly. So basically keeping things simple, but being, being really good at, at the technology that you are using and, and being really good at your training process. So what I recommend is use heart rate, especially in biking and running. Swimming is also now possible in some ways, depending on what monitor you're using, but it's maybe not absolutely it's not as common so it's not it's not something that i say to my athletes that you have to use heart rate swimming but but it's something that can be can be useful can be nice but definitely heart rate on the bike and the run and uh use speed in all three sports because speed is how we get faster how we get mm -hmm. from point a to point b so swimming biking and running and that's important on the bike as well when you're training outdoors it's not just about power it's speed is more important if you're riding 40 kilometers an hour at 150 watts then that's a good sign don't, that's don't what care you that's want your... yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, and use power on the bike because it is a really good metric and uh, and it is hard otherwise to um with on on the bike because of the changes in terrain changes in weather conditions they have some such an impact on on speed that just for structured training power is really good so so when you use both speed which will tell you okay what what is my how how quickly am i going to be able to do the race that's a key thing but heart rate and power for let's say internal load and external load speed is also external load uh of mm -hmm. course and and then also use it's not technology but of course use rpe, RPE your yeah. rating of perceived exertion and then then you have uh, metrics for both 
internal and external load and and when you see that you're you're getting a higher external output so higher power or higher speed for the same internal load so same rpe same heart rate or lower rpe lower heart rate then that's a good sign uh and uh, but then the the other thing as well is uh can well heart rate is tricky as well that's why you need to use heart rate and rpe because if you get lower heart rate for the same power, the same speed, that can be sometimes a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing. It can be a sign of overreaching, tired. you're tired, you're too fatigued. So that's why you need to also understand, okay, how am I feeling? Am I Is my heart rate lower and I'm feeling good? It's feeling easy. Then, okay, yeah, that's a good sign. But if, if your heart rate is low and you're feeling a bit tired, a bit sluggish, then yeah, that's a sign of fatigue Pe and you need to people recover. Tend People tend now to, because of the technology, to avoid a lot the signs and the precision exertion uh, part. But I believe that uh, RPE is like a combination of a lot of uh, indicators, uh, heart rate, yep. blood lactate, maybe uh, muscle oxidation, uh, it's uh, it, glycolytical part. So when Temper you feel that you are... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, psychology, normally, all yeah. sorts of things. If you have like experience and now I'm starting to work in threshold uh, on the run, I, I start to use lactate. And when coach is taking lactate from me, I normally say, yeah, maybe it's over. Maybe I'm a little bit over pacing or under pacing. And normally it, it correlates very well, uh, RPE or PSE yeah, in Portuguese uh, to lactate. So if you have lactate, it's very good. But when you start using lactate, you know that the RPE is very good because you match. They match very well. Okay, sometimes maybe you will be a very low RPE and then the lactate is higher. But that can be uh, because of other factors like caffeine intake or uh, you eat a lot of carbs and then the lactate uh, high a little bit. So you need... I, I believe still RPE is one of the most, if not the best indicator, especially if you yeah. don't have a lot of money to waste on lactate. Exactly. Yeah. No, with, um, with, with my most advanced athletes, the ones that will race professionally or try to race professionally, I use mostly RPE, uh, and uh, and they are the ones that really need the training to be optimal. And when I really mm -hmm. need the training to be absolutely optimal, then in some in these cases, RPE is for me the best. Uh, also because they have the experience to use it very well. Mm -hmm. but, but I think this is something that everybody should strive to get to the point that you can basically do most of your training based on RPE. based on RPE. But still, you still get collect the other data so that you see where you are and you can triangulate RPE and heart rate and pace or power. But, uh, but yeah, I, I agree. And then I think that the one other point about technology is the, the area, well, there, there are, there is a lot of technology that I think that you really shouldn't be using. It's not useful. There, there are two categories of devices and gadgets that are, let's say negative there, or there are two reasons that it could be negative. One is if they're not accurate at all. So an example would be whoop, there's quite a bit of research showing that the whoop is very bad. It doesn't measure sleep correctly. The recovery has nothing mm -hmm. to do with more validated recovery scales. That's the aura ring is a bit the aura ring is a bit better because it actually measures measures heart rate variability better than than the whoop does and it doesn't do as much calculations and algorithms as far as I understand. But I still but the the problem with the aura ring and and with HRV in general is that I still think that it's not yet clear that it is very good actionable advice that you I, I think it's more honestly based on feeling like do you feel mm -hmm. good do you feel that you mm -hmm. can do the training That's there was some research too. yeah there was some research recently that compared a, a group that trained with hrv guiding should you train hard or not and a group that trained with letting their feeling guide and a group that let their feeling guide it they perform better at mm -hmm. the end so hrv you can measure it accurately can, but it's yeah. maybe not actionable because in the end of the day the if the the app is saying that you are perfect but you feel bad you will not yeah. perform and other yeah. way if the app say that you are bad but you are feeling good you can perform so that's i think yeah. that's a very interesting thing and i i believe i agree and 
maybe it's money that you can waste in other stuff that maybe will provide better um, upgrades and help to your performance and and race uh, results and training wise. So yeah, interesting topic uh, covered. Um, we have a lot more to to cover, but. Uh, I will take that for, for another uh, interview uh, in Portuguese next time, <laughs> if the, the classes in Portuguese are getting better and better. But uh, I have still some fast questions that we say here, perguntas rápidas. Yeah, just to try to be as fast as possible. If you want to say a little bit more than just one or two words, you obviously you can uh, say more. Um, so the first one is training pro athletes or age group? Both a good mix, uh, 80-20, 20% pros, 80% age groupers. <laughs> okay. Because it's quite more demanding to, to work yep. with professionals. Okay. So if you work just with professionals, we, we will have much less group. Exactly. How, yep. how much, uh, athletes that you are now working around? Number. Well, I, I I I only coach ten athletes. I've coached ten athletes for a long or around like ninety, eleven athletes for a long time. But I obviously I spend a lot of time on the podcast and also just the the business uh, as well. We have a few other coaches in the business, so okay. so uh, yeah, what I have time for is ten uh, around ten athletes. Okay, um, one thing that you don't achieve as a coach that you want to achieve. Um. We help somebody win be, win a professional race. Okay. You you have coach uh, James Teagle. Uh, James never win a professional no, yet. I don't. Uh, no, I, I haven't coached James. No. Ah, okay, James okay. is James is self coached. Uh, but yeah, I've never coached him. Ah, okay. Um, and as an athlete, one thing that you want to achieve. Any um, personal goal. I would like to do under four hours for the half distance and uh, I will try to do it in Cominia this year. Oh, okay. <laughs> It's a good one. Um, the podcast of that triathlon show where you learn the most. It's quite hard. <laughs> where? Which which episode? Which guest? Or uh, No, you need to say an episode where you can pick that is one of the most or You can say more oh, okay. than one. Just to people maybe have the curiosity to go and listen right. to that episode. Okay. Um, one episode. It's hard, I know. <laughs> yeah. I, I am going to say I have a series, an old series of episodes, the Beginner Tip series. I think still a lot of listeners here are more beginners or maybe not complete beginners, but they, they're not, they haven't been doing triathlon for such a long time. I think there's a lot of value in those older episodes that are short and, but they are about the most mm -hmm. fundamental things for beginners. So for a lot of people, I think that those are the most important. That's a series of episodes. It's on the web, on the website. You can find it easily. Okay. Um, Pick a winner for uh, Kona 2024 and for Olympics. So men's in Kona uh, and then Olympics, both female and men. You can say, uh, yeah. yeah, just the winner. Uh, yeah, Olymp Olympics. I actually did this with the athlete in Lanzarote. We did some picks there. So Beth Potter and Alex Yee, uh, boring, same as the test event, but I, I think that they are the ones to beat. Um, uh, Kona, um, And Haug. No, no, no. Kona this year, just men's. Oh, sorry, middle men's. Yeah. Men's, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I mixed up mixed up who was racing where. Yeah, and um, Haug for Nice. Yeah. And Haug for Nice. Um, yeah, or actually, I I think, uh, yeah, it's harder for Nice. I'm not sure if she has the bike strength. For Kona, I am going to say Sam Laidlow. And uh, for... Nice, I am going to say Cat Matthews. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good pick. Um, and just a curiosity, um, how much time you believe Alexi will need to run to win the Olympics? Because he ran 29 flat uh, in the trials, but I believe it will requir requires a sub-29 minutes, but um 
I think that the, if he does the same run, it could be enough. Okay. Because I think that the the way that the bike will work, it's there's a bit fewer athletes, so there will be slightly smaller groups, and it will maybe take a bit longer for the packs to get together. So maybe the bike will be a bit harder. Also, the French will really work hard to break it apart. So I think people will be more tired than they were in the test event from the bike. So maybe, yeah, I'm I'm gonna say that if he does the same run. I think that he will win if he's in T2 with the other people, of course. Okay. Um, best triathlon or endurance book? Inigo Mujica's Endurance Training. It's a big textbook, basically mm -hmm. based on all of the training science. And they, there is a new second. I have the first and the second edition. I haven't no, read the second edition, edition yet. It's quite yeah. uh, expensive, no? Yes. I see it. Yes. It's uh, <laughs> most 200 One euros, no? Yeah, yeah, it's it's an investment for sure, but, yeah, uh, but based on the okay. based on the first edition, it's it's definitely worth it. It values the the investment, okay. Yeah. Um, the greatest triathlete of all time. Um, um, yeah, I, I that that's that's too hard. There are a few that okay. could be up there. I think I've basically. Jan Frodeno, Christian Blumenfeld, Daniel Arif all have, and Alistair Brownlee all have uh, good arguments for being considered the best of all time. But mm -hmm. it depends a bit on what you value. Okay. Um, Thor Duffy maybe has some arguments as well. Quite hard, fast questions, no? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the last one, and let's see, it's to finish the podcast, a phrase in Portuguese for our listeners. <laughs> a phrase in Portuguese. <laughs> 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 uh, it can be simple uh, just to simple, finish this sim simple fan obrigado pelo convite eu agradeço muito eu eu gostei de falar contigo e espero que todos gostam de ouvir este podcast muito bom muito bom thanks Michael, obrigado uh, Thank you. Yeah, I, I I believe it's a, a fantastic way to finish this. Um, portanto, damos por concluído aqui o podcast com o Michael um, de forma divertida. Acho que foi um dos podcasts mais interessantes em termos de quem gosta de podcasts com um teor científico e mais técnico. Acho que temos aqui imensa matéria para explorar. Um, espero que, que pronto, se tenha percebido o podcast o melhor possível da minha parte esforcei-me ao máximo para ter um inglês minimamente coerente um, e portanto agradecer a todos os que assistiram já sabem que vai haver agora um conteúdo extra que eu vou gravar com o Michael diretamente para o membership do Buy Me A Coffee por isso, como eu disse no início, se quiserem aderir é o primeiro link na descrição um, vamos ten vou tentar produzir o máximo de conteúdo possível a ideia é também trazer conteúdos para beginners, como o Michael falou um, e portanto se quiserem apoiar o canal dessa maneira é, é sempre bom e têm acesso a mais conteúdos uh, portanto, obrigado a todos e até ao próximo episódio, tchau tchau